Uh, I think we have awaited our stylish uh, five minutes uh, for uh, latecomers, and uh, today's topic is dendrobiums. And dendrobiums are confusing. We have a whole chapter in this wonderful book, Florida Orchid Growing, month by month, on dendrobiums. Uh, and it's not enough to know that you're dealing with a, a particular uh, genus in dendrobium, but you need to know the section of dendrobium that you're uh, uh, dealing with. Dendrobiums are a huge group. There are probably about 1,500 or more species of dendrobiums. Um, give you an idea of how that fits into the structure of the plant world. There are about as many dendrobiums as there are palms. So uh, the one genus in the Orchidaceae is as big as a whole uh, natural order there of uh, other plants. So, and they range all the way from northern, uh, northwestern India, all the way uh, southward uh, and eastward. Uh, eastward, they range all the way to uh, Japan. Southward, they range uh, all the way to uh, Australia and uh, to uh, New Guinea and beyond to the Solomon uh, Islands. So a huge, huge area. A uh, vast, vast amount of geography, um, a, uh, roughly a third of the planet. Uh, and um, so there are a lot of different habitats there. And these plants come from very, very different, uh, different uh, environments and require uh, substantially different treatments. This plant that you see in my hand here, uh, Dendrobium primulinum, is uh, belongs to the section that we call in modern parlance section dendrobium. Uh, uh, the way in which uh, botanists uh, define sections now is based upon uh, the first plant that was discovered and described tends to take the uh, epithet of the genus, in this case dendrobium. So, these are what our friends uh, in Australia call soft cane dendrobiums. The canes are flaccid. You can bend them around. You could tie them into knots if you had a mind to, uh, and if they were long enough. Uh, but um, the plant that you see in my hand, uh, uh, these are also known as uh, nobile type dendrobiums. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, they are uh, uh, they are mostly from the Himalayas, although they do range southward into uh, Indonesia and eastward all the way to the, uh, the Philippines and eastward to, uh, to Japan. Uh, these plants are extremely cold tolerant. They will take temperatures down to, but not including, freezing. 32 degrees Fahrenheit, zero centigrade. So these things, if you can take them down to 34 degrees or one degree uh, Celsius, uh, they're gonna just be happy as clams. And what they would do in a state of nature is they would lose all of their leaves, which is exactly what's happened here. And after these plants have lost all their leaves, if they have been sufficiently chilled, then they will start to uh, flower in the springtime. You can see the flower buds there just starting and uh, I'm not certain of an exact number there but uh, I think probably they need um, uh, something on the order of uh, uh, 20 or more hours below 15 degrees uh, Celsius 10 degrees uh, uh, excuse me 60 degrees Fahrenheit uh, 15 degrees uh, Celsius even better if it gets colder these these guys are just as happy as clams if the temperature were to drop down into the uh, into the 30s down to uh, four or five degrees Celsius uh, 30 uh, mid 30s they're just absolutely ecstatic they'll bloom all the better for it you had a question sir I can understand the restrictions you know, north and south environment also the restrictions going east to west? No, it's just a question of uh, more than anything else temperatures that we we're just describing and also these are plants that come from monsoon climates. They come from a, from climates wherever they are east, west, north or south in which the uh, plants are subjected uh, to uh, periods of uh, extended drought 
and they are subjected to uh, uh, cold uh, and uh, they oftentimes come from um, they also oftentimes uh, come from places where the forests that they live in are deciduous so that they get brighter light uh, during the uh, the winter months and uh, these are plants that are just very 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 tough uh, uh, when uh, these plants are uh, dormant uh, here in South Florida we talk about them being carefree for about five to six months out of the year what you want to do with this plant is you want to just hang it out at the edge of your orchid collection and forget about it Whatever rain it gets uh, in the course of the winter is almost certainly enough. Uh, some winters, like last winter, we had too much rain, uh, which they didn't like, and they didn't bloom very well as a result thereof. Uh, if it gets cold, short of uh, actual, uh, an actual freeze, they're just as happy as clams there, and uh, they uh, need absolutely no care until they have finished flowering. And when they finish flowering, then they will start to break a, uh, a new growth. Um, and when that new growth, uh, you see that new growth coming, you can water them very heavily. And then you can continue avoiding watering them for as much as two weeks. And then you can water them very heavily again. All of this is provided that uh, a late uh, cold front has not already watered them very heavily. This is the sort of climate that they come from in which uh, a cold front will dump a large amount of rain, but it's still very much the dry season. And these plants have uh, a new growth, which is some of us are old enough to remember uh, the pre-plastic era when you had something that was called a traveling drinking cup, which was would collapse upon itself and you would pull it out in uh, little metal uh, tin cups. Uh, uh, that's the way the uh, new growth of these are. They're convolute. The leaves are rolled up inside there. So it's forming like a cup. And what you want to do is you want to avoid water standing in that uh, cupped new growth. It's also starting out from the base of the plant where it's more shaded, uh, particularly if they're in pots uh, and they're likely to stay moister down there uh, close to the uh, whatever they're mounted on or whatever they're potted in. And that tends to present a danger to that new growth. As the new growth progresses, you continue on with that, uh, uh, with that um, uh, uh, careful watering. You can also apply liquid fertilizer at that point. Uh, the standard recommended one for orchids, which is low phosphorus, the Michigan State formula, or one that's equivalent. We like to use time-release fertilizer on these guys. Time-release fertilizer is ideally suited to the culture of this group of dendrobiums. If you put a six-month formula time-release fertilizer, again, look for one with low phosphorus. Down at Lowe's, they have one for avocado and citrus. Uh, which has a low middle number. That's the one you want to get. And what we do is we put uh, a dab of carpenter's glue on the uh, mount in this case, and then we uh, put the uh, pour the uh, fertilizer on there, and uh, it uh, it sticks. Uh, the uh, by the time that uh, fertilizer is exhausted, the plant will be ready to start to rest. So that new growth continues on out with the careful watering. Once it gets partially grown, a quarter of the way or, uh, or even less, you can pretty much treat it like a cat layer. You water them when they get very dry. You let them dry out uh, to be quite dry, and you give them heavy watering in between. You can apply liquid fertilizer to give them a little bit of extra oomph in addition to the, uh, the time release fertilizer. And these plants will grow on uh, pretty peacefully. They like good air circulation. They like bright light, about the same again as a cattleya, bright light, uh, not full sun. And they will continue growing on out uh, without any uh, major problems, except come the end of July and the beginning of August, when the weather starts to get just a little bit drier, then uh, these plants are oftentimes subject to attack by mites. If you have a period when it hasn't rained for a week uh, or so in the uh, midsummer, it might be a good time to think about spraying these guys for mites. There are various formulas for it in the, uh, this wonderful book, Florida Orchid Growing, month by month. Uh, soap is excellent. If you spray for mites, you spray once. 
then you spray again in seven to ten days. So one of the theories about why these plants lose all their leaves, and it's also true of uh, the Catacetinae, Catacetums and Cygnoces and Mormodes, is that uh, this is a way in which the plant has evolved to strip itself from mites. It's shedding its leaves, it's shedding its mites, uh, and so it gets a fresh start so that the mite population cannot build up on it. Uh, okay, so we're going on growing and we're growing and we're watching out there in uh, uh, late July and August for mites. Nothing much more there, everything going business as usual. And we'll notice that the ends of the leaf sometime in uh, September, sometimes it goes as long as uh, the first week or so of October, the leaves have started to get smaller and then they've stopped appearing at all. The bulb is maturing. At that point, you cut off all the water. You don't give it any more liquid fertilizer. You basically hang them out to dry. And if you, uh, if you don't uh, give them any fertilizer and any water, if you punish them enough, then they will be very, very productive and they'll bloom for you heavily in the springtime. Uh, in any case, that's, that, that's your soft uh, cane uh, dendrobiums, uh, also known as section eugenanthe, the good flowered ones. Uh, and that's one section of dendrobium. Yes, ma'am. Uh, when they hit the babies, the kikis. Yeah, the kikis on the bulbs, yes. Mm -hmm. We usually wait uh, and leave them on there for a whole year until they're breaking a second growth and then we will cut them uh, off or you can just prize them off. Uh, they will pop right off if you, uh, but you can also just cut them with uh, uh, the bulb, a chunk of the bulb that they're on and pop those up. Uh, if you get a lot of kikis, a lot of babies, a lot of offshoots, ihos, uh, it is also indicative of the fact that you're watering and fertilizing too much across the winter. If you only get uh, those, then it's a sure sign that you're watering and fertilizing too much across the woods. So every one of the buds that produces a flower is capable of producing a vegetative growth as well. Uh, so uh, every leaf axle is capable of either producing a vegetative offshoot or a floral offshoot. Well, I got them on the one that flowered last year. Right. Yeah, they can, you know, on the old bulbs, that's much better. Uh, so. Uh, and of course you can uh, then take those and you can mount them again on, uh, if it's mounted, what you have is mounted, or you can put them into a larger, slightly larger container. Uh, if you do pot these plants, you want to pot them in the smallest possible uh, container so that you can dry them out thoroughly in the winter time. Uh, and uh, they like, they grow better on their own roots than on just about any media. When we pot these plants, we pot them usually in a mixture of uh, uh, coconut chips and charcoal. You can pot them into tree fern. Uh, we were very, have been very successful with them in wood chips and charcoal, but pot them into the smallest. The bulbs are very close together. They want to be tight. And uh, eventually a plant like this one the mounted up like this, eventually what will happen is that the roots of this plant will just assume all of that coconut uh, shell. And then what you'll have is a mass of dendrobium roots, which is sort of self-sustaining. Uh, they uh, don't like to be uh, moved around or repotted. Uh, you put them into a small pot, and uh, if they actually outgrow the small pot, then the best strategy is just to break the pot and slip them into a slightly larger one. You can leave the babies on, they will uh, flower from there, sure. It depends on how easy it is to accommodate them and how aesthetic uh, it, it is. Uh, eventually they will come off, eventually the bulb they're on will die. So uh, the woods decay, the woods decay and fall, and after many a summer dies the swan. All right, moving right along. Moving right along. Now, this, uh, is another sort of dendrobium. This is one of the ones that uh, our uh, Australian uh, cousins call hard cane dendrobiums. If I tried to bend that to the degree I bent that uh, soft cane dendrobium, it would just absolutely uh, pop off. Um, so uh, these plants are, uh, are native to uh, the more southern uh, uh, end of uh, the uh, range of dendrobiums, uh, south pretty much all of them are pretty much south 
all of this this section are entirely south of the uh, the Wallace line, uh, and um, so they are part of the, uh, the geography of the Australian tectoral uh, plate, tectonic plate, uh, and uh, these plants, these plants which uh, are the parents of the ones that you see down in uh, uh, Home Depot and uh, in Walmart, uh, uh, these plants are among the most cold sensitive of all orchids. These plants will be damaged by temperatures below 10 degrees Celsius, 60 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, and uh, this is one of the most common mistakes that people, amateurs make, or beginners make with dendrobiums, uh, is that uh, they, uh, uh, they allow these plants to be out in the cold. It, there are very few winters, even an exceptionally mild winter, like the one that we are having right now, in which your temperatures do not go below that threshold of 60 degrees Fahrenheit, 10 degrees Celsius. Uh, we had uh, 53 degrees here this morning, and uh, winter is virtually over. Uh, so these plants will start to lose leaves. In fact, this, den this one has lost some leaves because it was growing outside. Uh, dendrobiums are not our major focus here. Uh, we uh, grow uh, some of them because uh, it's fun, and lots of them because it's easy, and some of them because they're a wonderful cash crop uh, at uh, uh, spring shows. These plants do not want to be cold. They do go not totally dormant, but they, uh, they have a uh, much uh, semi-dormancy that they go through in the wintertime. They're not in active growth across the winter, but they still want some food, they still want some water. Not nearly uh, so dry, not nearly so uh, uh, restricted as the, uh, as the hard, uh, as the soft cane dendrobiums. These two in the springtime will start their new growth. And again, always a good idea with dendrobiums to make sure that they have good air circulation, that they're growing in bright, uh, uh, bright light, and that uh, they uh, are uh, uh, allowed to dry very, very rapidly. Uh, and again, they have that uh, cup-shaped new growth that you need to be careful water does not stand for too long. But again, these guys start out in the spring more or less the same time as their dormant uh, cousins. They'll usually start breaking growth in, uh, in March, uh, uh, Feb late February or March. And uh, again, pretty much the same uh, regimen to begin with. Be careful watering them, be careful fertilizing them, and then pretty much they're like a cattleya. Except in the fall, you just cut back a little on the watering, and above all, you keep these guys warm. Okay? And uh, they're, uh, they're easy to grow, they're fast. Uh, uh, they will flower off the old canes as well as the new. So if you grow a big specimen plant of these, then uh, they are, uh, uh, they're quite interesting. And this uh, is, a, is the closest uh, section related to, den that's Dendrobium phalaenopsis type. Uh, Phalaenanthe is the sectional uh, epithet. This one, uh, the sectional epithet is uh, Spathulata. And um, uh, the way in which they're most quickly distinguished, the two sections, is that in this section, the petals are narrower than the sepals. In Phalaenopsis, the petals are broader than the sepals. Everybody see that? Uh, of course, you have intersectional hybrids between the two of them, and there are a lot of those out there. Uh, and uh, they uh, will have uh, sepals and petals that are intermediate in, in between the two. Uh, and when these things are being judged, uh, they are judged uh, as Phalaenanthe if they have petals that are broader than their uh, sepals or as uh, spathuata if they have petals that are more narrow than their, uh, their sepals. So, uh, but pretty much the culture is exactly the same. These again are warm growers. You want to protect these from the cold. Uh, uh, I don't have an example to show you of uh, Dendrobium uh, uh, section Latouri, but Latouri uh, which also hybridizes uh, with both of these sections and again is an Australian New Guinea uh, 
south of the Wallace line plants. Those two, we're seeing more and more hybrids from them. They produce exceptionally long-lasting flowers on nice compact plants. Section Latouri, uh, which is also illustrated here in Florida orchid growing, uh, is uh, uh, you can see a lot of them are green flowers uh, with uh, colored lips. Uh, and uh, pretty much the same culture. Some of this group come from high elevation and are really cold growers, but uh, most of the ones that we see here uh, uh, in their hybrids are uh, from uh, lowlands. Basically the same treatment as uh, Phalaenanthae and uh, Spathua. So if they're mounted on a tree, yes, ma'am. we know that some cold weather is coming up, what can we do? Not much. Uh, you know, the American Orchid Society's headquarters was in West Palm Beach. And some bright spark decided, well, you know, we got all these oak trees out there in the parking lot. Why don't we get some orchids and put them on there? And they went out and they bought a bunch of dendrobium phalaenopsis. And uh, they put them on there. And sure enough, uh, they made an impression on all the visitors. My God, look at those ugly pines. You know, it, uh, <laughs> They look like death warmed over, uh, and uh, so these are cheap uh, to buy at uh, Home uh, Depot, but they're not the ones you want to be mounting on your things. So, you know, on the other hand, uh, our friend the, uh, the soft cane dendrobiums, these thrive there. In fact, uh, if you look carefully on your way out, uh, some of them are still exist on the avocado trees there. We have dendrobium ophylum. Uh, growing on our mango trees up in the front, they make just beautiful, incredible cascades. Uh, uh, in fact, if you just if you look to your left as you turn the corner to make that turn going outward, you'll see some of them growing on avocado trees uh, there as well. Uh, those dendrobiums up in those trees have been there for 20 years, and uh, nearly, and uh, they're they're there by the grace of God, you know, uh, and uh, not of ourselves, lest any man should boast. Okay, about uh, these uh, uh, groups that come from uh, warmer climates. Uh, here's yet another uh, section of dendrobium. This is dendrobium petalonium. This is dendrobium smileyi. I actually saw this growing in Australia, uh, in North Queensland, uh, on a tree by a river. They, they uh, are very much like the other hard cane dendrobiums. The culture is not, not a lot different. Uh, uh, and uh, basically, they want to be kept warm. If you, uh, if you don't, then you're going to do things like burn their leaves here. This is some December cold that uh, caused that damage. Uh, but again, the culture very much like your hard cane dendrobiums. There are Oh, okay. There are a couple of other sections that are fairly common in cultivation, and one of them is our very favorite of all dendrobiums. Uh, uh, this is dendrobium section calista. And these again are Himalayan uh, species. Uh, uh, Kala means beautiful in Greek, uh, and these are just incredibly beautiful plants. Uh, they can produce an abundance of flowers in a very, very small space. Uh, and uh, uh, they are also quite, quite cold tolerant. These plants are perfectly happy with temperatures down to the mid 30s and will not be damaged. They'll bloom all the more strongly for it. Like other dendrobiums, uh, you want to be careful uh, uh, with the new growths, but not nearly so careful. Uh, these plants will actually produce two to three, uh, sometimes even four growths a year. So they will rapidly uh, grow into a, uh, a specimen plant. Uh, the plant that you see in my hand is uh, just reaching maturity. It's already growing in a couple of directions here. In three or four more years, we'll have this plant in a six inch basket. And uh, uh, they are so beautiful that people will pay $150 for them down at the Fairchild Show and be happy to get them, happy to get them. So these plants are a real investment of your time uh, and they're well worth owning. The only drawback to this plant is that uh, uh, unlike uh, the uh, hard cane dendrobiums, these flowers last seven to 10 days and they are gone. Uh, but uh, they are seven to 10 days of just wonderful beauty, particularly when they've been grown into a specimen plant. 
Uh, they're tough little devils. They tend not to lose their leaves unless the, uh, under extreme conditions. They are subject uh, to attack by mites. Uh, when you see uh, blackening of uh, the undersides of the foliage here, there's a little bit of mite damage here on this one. Uh, and you can see it looks almost white and then you can see a little dark speckles in there. That is mite damage and as it oxidizes it'll turn black. So these, uh, these guys are one of the things that uh, when you're doing your winter spraying for mites, you want to make sure that you uh, get these guys well covered. Uh, and again, to control mites you need to spray twice initially and then again in 7 to 10 days. In the winter time when the temperatures are uh, in the low 80s or lower, we recommend spraying with oil. Uh, you can use just regular cooking oil, uh, canola, at the rate of uh, three tablespoons per gallon of water. Keep it shook up so that it coats the plant, particularly the undersurfaces of the leaves. Mites like to stay dry. They like the undersides of the leaves. So you spray them, coat them with that oil, and then in seven to 10 days, you spray them with soap at the rate of two ounces per gallon. Again, uh, Ajax liquid dishwashing soap is what we recommend and uh, very very effective if you can do that once or even twice across the winter you will uh, keep your mites under control and you will keep these the foliage on these guys looking prettier okay. again uh, we like to grow these in pots but they do very well mounted also you can mount them on your trees not bad what, uh, what category was that again this is called calista yes. cala tokalan uh, the beautiful uh, one of the great confusions in Western thinking comes out of the fact that the words for beautiful and good are almost identical in Greek. Would that it were true. But what can ail the night at arms alone and palely loitering? The sedge has withered from the lake and no bird calls. Um, do you withhold the watering on that one also? Yes, you do. You do. Uh, uh, again, they're perfectly carefree uh, from uh, uh, October until they finish flowering. The other thing that I was going to mention about these guys and uh, uh, that is different is that they put up several growths a year. When you see that new growth coming, if you can give it a shot of liquid fertilizer at that point, then uh, they will be all the better for it because from the time that that new growth starts till the time when the bulb is not mature but fully formed is only about two weeks. They're just incredible. Two to three weeks, they make up a whole bulb. And they'll do it two and three times a year. And if you fertilize them uh, while they're doing that, we, we love growing these, uh, these little guys. We don't uh, ever treat them quite as well as we should, but uh, they are just wonderfully uh, amenable uh, plants. Uh, the other thing you need to watch out for with these guys in particular uh, is that uh, uh, slugs and snails like the new growths of these Callistodendrobiums more than anything else. Uh, and they also like the new flower spikes. Uh, one year we had a single Cuban garden snail that was about that big. And I, and my Dendrobium uh, Lindway eyes were just spiking up. And I could see where he began. And I followed his trail for about uh, uh, 20 or 25 feet down my bench. And that one snail, probably cost me $500 in lost production. Just eating every one of those, they were, all those little flower spikes were coming up just like, just like the uh, little tender uh, Lilliputian uh, asparagus sprouts. And he was munching down on every one of them, bless his heart. Uh, they never existed here when I was a child. That's, it wasn't, the, our Cuban friends didn't just bring us the uh, coladas, the cafe, uh, uh, Negro in the Mame uh, Colorado ice cream. They brought us the Cuban garden snail. And uh, so it goes, so it goes. But uh, they're here now. Uh, okay. Lots more of dendrobiums. Lots more of dendrobiums. Uh, uh, here is another uh, dendrobium. We're seeing a lot more of these and a lot of hybrids from them. And uh, this is, uh, the one in my hand is actually Dendrobium formosum. We used to call this section Negro Hirsute because you can see here at the, see those sort of black rings on the, on the bulbs? Those are actually little tiny, tiny, tiny fine black hairs. So Negro Hirsute means black haired. Uh, and uh, uh, 
These uh, uh, produce uh, some spectacular flowers on relatively uh, small plants, and they're they're quite long-lasting. Most of them are uh, are white. Uh, some of them uh, have red lips, and uh, they are, uh, as you can see here, uh, big, spectacular white flowers. And they'll last for about a month and a half, two months. They're really very, very beautiful things. And the Hawaiians have been doing a great deal of hybridizing with these guys. And they have produced some marvelous hybrids. And uh, uh, they are well worth growing. They're easy to grow here. Again, the culture uh, very much like uh, the other dendrobiums in that they start to grow in the springtime. Ideal subjects for a time-release fertilizer. Put it on in February or March, uh, April at the latest. Uh, and then, uh, you know, be careful with the new growths, uh, watering the new growths. And then during the summer, again, uh, uh, you uh, treat them very much like a cattleya. The foliage is, uh, on these is, uh, is softer than it is in section callista. They are subject to uh, mite damage during the summer uh, when the uh, bulbs are making up. This one we managed to keep pretty clean. Uh, I'm amazed. Uh, but uh, uh, again, when these reach uh, October, you cut off the water, you cut off the fertilizer. These uh, will take temperatures down to uh, 40 degrees, much colder than that. Probably should protect them. Get them in a little bit because they're going to lose more leaves than you want to. The leaves persist for two or three years on the plant. When the plant is mature, they will flower off those for uh, uh, two to three years. And again, uh, section formosum and very, very pretty. There are, we have talked about five or six sections of dendrobium here. There are, depending on who is doing the slicing and dicing, there are perhaps as many as 48 sections of dendrobiums, each with just a little variations on the theme. Uh, so when you're dealing with uh, dendrobiums, always be sure to ask what section. Always be sure to ask uh, about the um, uh, cultural habits. This too is a dendrobium. And there are a lot of these. Uh, uh, this, uh, this is one out of India. There are probably over 100 species in this group that have this beautiful fern-like foliage. Uh, we grow these in a little bit uh, shadier conditions when we're treating them right. And we grow them in potting media, in pots. And uh, if you keep them clean and grow them on, it makes a beautiful foliage plant. Uh, section Aporum. Uh, and um, uh, uh, these I think you can uh, obtain at uh, Redland from some of the dealers bringing them in out of Thailand and out of Malaya. They range all the way down to uh, Australia also. We run into these in our travels in, uh, in Indonesia and uh, they're interesting things. Okay, uh, we do have time for questions. Do we have any questions? I have another question. Yes, ma'am. If I'm still talking about my thing. Your denodrobium anosmum. Yes. Flower next year, or is it gone? Is it Generally gone? speaking, they tend not to flower off a cane uh, unless they, it has matured that year. Although you will occasionally see uh, uh, buds coming on older canes. But by and large, no. The answer is no. They tend not to. They tend instead to form the offshoots, which everyone uh, has taken on the Hawaiian term for uh, kikis. Uh, hijos uh, in Spanish. Uh, offshoots would be the generic. I have one, but I now realize that I don't think I left it outside in the cold night, so probably skip a year. You are going to be punished. You are going I to be. No good deed goes unpunished, ma'am. You know that. It's in the wine room. Yeah, well, that's. You know, interesting stuff. Yes, yeah, so you could try that. Uh, uh, <laughs> it. Uh, uh, The, yes, you could definitely try that. Uh, uh, in fact, you could definitely do that. I would, I would try that if I were you, if I had such a thing, uh, you know. Uh, oh, blessed are those who have enough wine for a whole room, Phil. Uh, that I, 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 I only manage a, a shelf. Uh, so, uh, 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 but seriously, to, uh, yeah, no, no, seriously, uh, uh, I'm not sure. There is a, uh, a, a Japanese uh, company called Yamamoto, 
and they are famous for these uh, soft cane uh, dendrobiums. They've done a great deal of hybridizing with them, and they produce them uh, for a good part of the winter and spring months. And they do it by growing them, uh, they grow them there on the big island of Hawaii. And uh, uh, they grow them at a uh, low level. And when the order comes in that uh, we want uh, 10,000 uh, dendrobiums for uh, April, when is Easter? April 23rd? April which? April 1. April 1. Oh, look at that. April Fool's Day. Hmm. That's somehow strangely appropriate, but uh, then again, no blasphemy on Saturday. I haven't got Sunday to get through yet. Uh, the, uh, um, they take them up the hill at, at X number of days and allow them to be chilled for those nights, X number of hours. And I don't know the answer to that. It's not something they're publishing. And uh, it's proprietary information. But you, you with your wine in the room, might be able to uh, answer that question for us. Uh, yeah. take I, I don't know if they had enough cold nights. They, that is the question that we are asking. And part of the answer, part of the answer is that little soft cane uh, dendrobium I just showed you. We had a number of cold nights in December, and we've had relatively few since and uh, but uh, we have had some cold nights and but the really cold cold came in December right. and, really yeah, that was a mistake don't ever do that again <laughs> uh, now you know uh, but uh, seriously it would be interesting to know uh, when uh, 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 when Kerry's bromeliads was getting into growing orchids on a large scale, they were looking for crops. And I suggested to them growing uh, um, a, uh, uh, growing these, uh, these guys, uh, the uh, soft cane dendrobiums. And I pointed out the success of, uh, uh, of uh, Yamamoto. And he said, oh, but he takes them up the mountain. And I said, well, you know, you live on the mountain. Here in the Redland, we live on the mountain. And uh, uh, it was probably the low last night in Miami was probably on the uh, order of uh, uh, 65 or so. Here it was 53. And it's just because the air is so much drier and you get much more radiant uh, 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 heat radiating out of here. But uh, the answer for me to that question is, lies right there in those buds you right. see. So I think uh, that uh, we got enough early cold to have set buds here. Hopefully it carries through, uh, and this is also true here. Rigarde, there he is, uh, with uh, the, uh, uh, having set the flowers. This is, this is the first one of these that we flowered, this list is. First one of, the, uh, of those also. So it's leading me to believe that uh, uh, that early December cold probably was enough. Probably was enough, let's Can hope. Can I put so. copper on dendrobiums? No. That's something you definitely do not want to do. Uh, uh, Coside, uh, cupric hydroxide, uh, dendrobiums are very sensitive to copper. All of them. All of them. All of them. Yeah, don't. That's one uh, of the real caveats there. One of those things like don't use organophosphates on Brotonia hybrids. You know, some of these genera just seem to have extra sensitivity to certain things. Not surprising. With different genes. Oh, I didn't show you what makes a dendrobium a dendrobium. I'm going to show you what makes a dendrobium a dendrobium. And uh, is probably somehow part of the secret of their success. Okay. Dorsal sepal, petal, petal, lateral sepal, lateral sepal, lip. In dendrobiums, the two lateral sepals are fused at the base, and uh, uh, the spur of the uh, of the lip extends downward from it. That's that uh, fusing at the base is called a mentum, 
and mentor means chin uh, and so it's a little chin there and somehow that flower structure is just highly highly successful it carries through all of the sections of dendrobium and uh, more than anything else uh, absolutely more than anything else it's what makes a dendrobium a dendrobium uh, is that mentum it, uh, some things work out there in the big world and it's all about survival of the fittest this plant that you see here is a species that I collected on Ceram in the seed pods thereof on Ceram in uh, the Molucas Islands. I'm going back out there and uh, see if I can discover some more Vanda species. But along the way you run into these... Hmm? Oh, d dendrobiums are very fast growers. Uh, you can uh, produce dendrobiums from seed to uh, first flower in uh, just about two years. Uh, which is why they're so much cheaper than uh, than Vandas. Vandas and Cattleyas are five-year crop and it's very very difficult to, to be competitive with them uh, for that reason. Uh, the um, you know the red peppers that you buy down at Publix cost twice as much as the green peppers that's because they've been grown for three more weeks. Imagine three more years so uh, but uh, the marketplace is cruel. The marketplace is cruel. The prices that you see on those uh, Vandas over at that, uh, that we're selling over there, uh, 30 years ago, in 1987, we could get that same number of dollars in 1987 dollars wholesale. Wholesale. So orchids have become extreme, extraordinarily cheap here, but uh, uh, they're still beautiful. Go down to Kmart and buy them. Go down to Walgreens, uh, Walmart and buy them. Uh, and uh, if they're beautiful, they're beautiful. It doesn't matter what they cost. It only matters whether you can afford to buy them. <laughs> hey, well, uh, thanks for uh, your attention. And uh, this was the Dendrobium uh, section. Uh, if you go to www.motesorchids.com, uh, there are several other videos that uh, uh, on Vandas and other genera. And uh, we hope you enjoy them. We hope you learn from them. Uh, and uh, be sure and join our mailing list uh, and uh, let us know uh, what your concerns are. And you can always email me at martinmotes at gmail.com.